All right. I believe this means we are live by the skin of my teeth, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, tech fans of all shapes and sorts and sizes and persuasions. Welcome to another Monday morning tech chat show on the SGGQA podcast channel. I am Juan Carlos Bagnell, some gadget guy, the SGG of this terribly named podcast series, and the QA stands for question and answer. When we talk out these news topics every week, I like it to be a bit more of an interactive conversation, a bit more of a discussion, and that's why I like to hold my podcast on a Monday. So we've had some time to work out the news of the last week. Maybe there's been some breaking news, like we got a massive story this morning, and we can sort out our feels on those (laughs) topics all together as tech fans who like a broad discussion of technology, tech and politics, gaming, and the influence these products have over our daily waking lives. I'm already seeing a huge group in the live chat today. Rain327, Gary the Fireman, Matt Tyler, uh, Pet Peta. I think I got enough A's in there. Uh, Magus, uh, Goran Petrovic, Vasikos, Geet Madden, Uh, Matt Tyler, Drevin61, thank you all so much for jumping in, for joining us, because we've got a lot of news to cover. We've got a lot of topics to cover. We got some breaking news, like I said this morning, with uh, a BlackBerry announcement. And uh, we've got some tech and politics stories that we need to follow up on. These are topics that we've been talking about for a while, and we got a little news last week just to kind of add to those discussions. I'm going to try really hard, really hard, Uh, to make sure that this isn't a three-hour podcast. I really don't want this to be the Gilligan's Island of tech podcasts, where it's a three-hour tour, but then we go for 20 seasons of television. First of all, uh, if if you're of the persuasion to watch the sports ball, uh, I guess we should throw out a a shout-out, a congratulations of glory to the Kansas City Chiefs for scoring, was it their first Super Bowl win in something like 40 years? Someone who is more uh, into the sports ball, please correct me if I was wrong there. But um, the the, the Chiefs and the 49ers played a great game of football last night. Uh, My wife was there mostly to watch the commercials because we, my my wife and I came out of commercial casting and we still know a lot of the actors that are in uh, your favorite and least favorite commercials. And my daughter and another little girl who was around three years old ran around like crazy the whole night, hopped up on uh, a ton of chips and candy, and uh, it was a good time. A good time was had by all. So uh, um, 50 years, Rain 327, 50 years for the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, I thought the game was pretty solid. I, I have to admit, um, I... Uh, I used to be a diehard Broncos fan, especially when they were losing Super Bowls. That's kind of when I came into this, like, they're the best underdogs kind of fandom for the Denver Broncos. Over the last couple of years, my my football fandom has curtailed quite a bit in light of stories about how tax dollars go to support stadium construction and how the, the league has had issues with, uh, with um, head trauma and injuries to players and the sustainability of a game that brings in billions of dollars but kind of costs people their health. Uh, I, I've had that sort of liberal, guilty, internal conflict as to whether or not I was going to maintain my super hardcore football fandom. But even for some of those issues, it, it, it was an interesting night of gameplay. It was a fun night of gameplay. It was a great excuse to get a bunch of friends together and and cook up. We have a chili cook-off every year for the Super Bowl. We've been doing this for, for around seven years now, our group of friends here in California. And it's the chili chili cook-off, where it's green chili stew versus Texan-style chili. And uh, I think the green chili stew had a pretty good rep uh, last night for the New Mexican-style uh culinary experience that we've been putting together. So, um, (laughs) Matt Tyler, I thought he meant 50 years for housekeeping, (laughs) but it's, um, again, kind of like uh, when we have special days on the calendar or Hallmark days on the calendar, uh, something like the Super Bowl. I'm always down. Any excuse to throw a get together, to see your friends, to check in with the people that you care about, to, to find the excuse to pick up the phone and, and put together a potluck. You know, I'll use it, even for my internal conflict over over this game being celebrated at the tier that it is. Um, it was it was still a really fun night. So, um, congratulations, Kansas City Chiefs played a great game of football. So, we should probably get into some housekeeping. 
Uh, where are we? We're at 9.06. I'm going to adjust my camera here real quick because I'm shooting just a little bit high. Oh, yeah, that's comfy. I don't like it when my chin is covering my obnoxiously large watermark. Okay. Housekeeping, we can keep pretty brief. Um, I will be going through some changes. Uh, Gadget Lab 2.0, as we see it here today, will be retired over the next month and we'll be moving to Gadget Lab 3.0 in roughly the same size space, but in a different location. So um, I'm trying to wrap up a couple longer term videos, a couple reviews, and I'm trying to front load some of the production for hashtag 2020 coverage, hashtag 2020 hearing coverage. And uh, the, the production flow is gonna get a little wonky over the next month, over February. Um, but that said, I'm still going to be trying to get content out there. I'm still going to be producing videos. I'm still going to be writing articles. I might be writing more articles than producing videos just to try and keep up with the, the workload that we've got. And this last week was kind of the first week of that uh, affecting workflow. The week before, I got like five videos out and an editorial. This week, we kept it a little, this last week, we kept it a little, a little easier. So let me click this on right here. Uh, Im immediately, uh, a review I'm very proud of and for a product I'm very excited by, I I'm still very critical of true wireless earbuds, but the company One More has been impressing with their uh, wired and wireless solutions. I love their Bluetooth neckbands. And the One More earbuds they put out last year were very solid offering. This year, they've got a new pair. Uh, it it's a horrible product name. It's the One More True Wireless ANC in-ear headphones. That's the actual name of the product, which is really more a Google search string or a description than it is a product name. But uh, I can't fault what is a an absolutely phenomenal premium true wireless earbud experience, noise canceling, dual drivers. So there's a dynamic driver and a, a balanced arm in the earbud casing, which uh, I think helps tremendously for, for audio quality and fidelity. The sound stage is a very vibrant and punchy little earbud. The, the noise canceling is some of the most brutal noise canceling I think I've ever heard on an earbud. Um, just slightly outclassed by true cans with noise canceling, but uh, if you want the world to disappear around you, I, I think One More has probably one of the best solutions I've ever heard. And at a price tier that is very competitive against AirPod Pros and some of the upper tier of like Sennheiser and Sony solutions, One More continues to be a brand. Um, they're a boutique brand, but they continue to be a brand that focuses first on their core um, audio fidelity tuning. And they've been getting a lot more aggressive about tacking on the fun techie features as well. So I'll always, a fun conversation to be had covering their products. And then the other video I put out, I'm very excited about this commentary and it's a product and a, and a concept I'm gonna be covering a lot over 2020 is uh, seeing if we can get our smartphones to be more disruptive. The whole idea of a smartphone is pretty stagnant. You know, it's a glass slab, what you look up your Facebooks on. So, to really get our bang for buck, I think we need to start looking at the phone to replace other products. So I put out a video. The title of the video is, Your Phone is Faster Than a Laptop. And I've been making this performance claim in my videos and on somegadgetguy.com for, I don't know, almost two years now, that for many consumers, many, many consumers, the, uh, the smartphone in your pocket is grossly overpowered for the kind of smartphone use that you really need and that the compute power is likely enough to unseat your need for a dedicated laptop with a with a processor and a GPU and, and all of the computer guts. Your phone probably has enough compute power to get you through most consumer uh, situations, including some heavy lifting situations like gaming and uh, and content creation, like rendering video. So I put the, together this video and I did some comparison testing and I'm, I'm not being, I'm not trying to exaggerate. Obviously I'm being a little hyperbolic when I say, oh yeah, your phone's, your phone's faster. 
because I fully acknowledge you can't completely fairly test phones against laptops, but I don't think those that 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 granularity of specificity really matters for a lot of consumers. You know, because you're using a different app on a phone than the program you would use on a desk on on a desktop or a laptop, really doesn't change the fact that when you push render, a decent smartphone is often two to three times faster at producing a 4K video than a laptop would be. And to that same token, no one's out there producing feature films and documentaries on a 13-inch ultra-slim MacBook Air style laptop notebook PC. So that argument right out right out the window. But price to performance, smartphones have gotten incredibly competitive and we just lack a few really good accessories to realize that that power. Something like the next dock gets really exciting because it gives you the laptop form factor you might want. We just need a little bit more refinement and a little bit more polish, but it, in its current state, it's already outperforming laptops. So, um, that's housekeeping. Well, I did housekeeping in seven minutes. Someone give me an exact time. But um, those, those stories, as well as all of the articles and all of the stories we're going to be talking about this week, you can catch that on somegadgetguy.com, uh, the individual videos here. And then also the show notes for this podcast are going to have links to all of uh, all the stuff that we're going to be talking about this week. Like I said, we've got, it's actually, I'm going to try, I'm going to try to try to not make this um, a bummer of a podcast, but there are a handful of topics that that are getting kind of huh, getting kind of angsty to 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 speak about uh, from geet mad in 1991 people are doing real work on iPads which was just a bigger iPhone until iPad OS 13 showed up um i i i mean I, since the original iPad Pro came out this this has become a more important talking point where a computer is a computer is a computer if it's a pocket computer, it's still a computer. <laughs> and, and really what we lacked with the launch of the original iPad Pro was sophisticated applications to really make use of a pro tablet or a pro smartphone. And I think that's changed. Obviously, we don't have every single solution for every single legacy program on Windows PCs and Mac PCs, but the the mainstay options we have now are significantly more competitive and the sophistication of mobile apps has risen tremendously over the last five years so the content the quality the uh the workflow all much much more accessible than they've ever been which is which is pretty cool <laughs> basico say a cookie for one for the record time housekeeping uh, Matt Tyler, Juan will not mention, Juan will, Juan will not mention, Juan will not mention. I'm going to save Matt Tyler is trying to talk about a very specific political issue that's happening in his neck of the woods. And I'm not going to talk about it on this podcast because we're going to talk about something else regarding the EU in just a bit. Uh, first up, I, we have to cover some FCC news. Sorry, let's get into the news block. We've got news to talk about and I can sit here and ramble on far longer than I think anyone would want me to. Uh, this is a story that we've been covering loosely. Uh, who, who was it that originally put out um, doo, 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 a motherboard? So at the end of 2018, the beginning of 2019, we started seeing coverage that wireless carriers were taking location data on their customers and selling it in aggregate and in, in bulk to third party um data brokers, for lack of a better uh, better term. And it was extremely easy to follow individual behavior and link that to an individual consumer. So even though legally they were hiding behind this idea that they weren't selling your identifiable data, like my name isn't on all of this location data, it didn't change the fact that it was really easy to suss out who that location data belonged to. So um, there was an investigation. Uh, an investigation was started uh, in 2019. And 
We've reached something of a conclusion if we haven't quite untangled what the ramifications of this issue are. So this is an article uh, posted on Engadget. Let me go into screen share here. And I'm going to drop the link in the live chat. Uh, title, wireless carrier, oh, sorry, FCC, wireless carriers violated federal law by selling location data written up by Mariella Moon on Engadget.com. From the article, let me scroll down here. The FCC has finished investigating carriers' unauthorized disclosure and sale of subscribers' real-time location data, Chairman Ajit Pai has shared with lawmakers in the House of Representatives. In his letters, he told Energy and Commerce Committee Chairman Frank Pallone Jr. and others that the agency has come to a conclusion after an extensive probe, one or more carriers, quote, apparently violated federal law. Pai has also promised the lawmakers that the agency is going to take action against the offending carriers to ensure that they comply with laws that protect consumers' sensitive information. Um, um, uh, later in the article, all four major U.S. carriers promised to stop selling customer location data to aggregators after the information first came out. The companies made good on their word, though it took them a year to do so. They informed FCC Commissioner Jessica Rosenworcel that they had already halted sales to aggregators after she requested an update in 2019. <laughs> so they broke the law. They profited from your data in violating your privacy, but we don't have um, we don't have any word on what the ramifications of that will be. Uh, Pallone, uh, Frank Pallone Jr. said in a following in a statement, following our land, longstanding calls to take action, the FCC finally informed the committee today that one or more wireless carriers apparently violated federal privacy protections by turning a blind eye to the widespread disclosure of consumers' real-time location data. This is certainly a step in the right direction, but I'll be watching to make sure the FCC doesn't just let these lawbreakers off the hook with a slap on the wrist. I feel like at some point we'll need to do an accounting of what were the profit margins, how much was this data sold for, and that the ramifications of the penalty for violating the law, for breaking the law, and selling off your personal data should hurt. <laughs> like, if, if they just, if they serve up a, a carrier, you know, a, an internet service provider, a monster entity, a humongous multi-billion dollar corporation with like a $10 million fine, then that just encourages them to continue doing business that way. That was just a small fee or a small tax that would completely evapor evaporate in a company's monthly financial statement and is likely not balanced at all against the amount of money that they made in violating your privacy and selling off your personal data. I've been saying this for a while, and I don't feel like this is a liberal or a conservative issue. I feel like this is in an area where technology grossly outpaces our legal system, and we have significant issues keeping our elected officials on the pulse of these geeky topics. You know, if, if John Oliver doesn't make a video editorial about this stuff, it seems like our lawmakers are woefully undereducated about the ramifications of this type of data brokerage and uh, how it affects individual consumers, let alone the privacy implications, the security implications. A member of Trump's security detail was recently um, located via this type of data acquisition and location data sharing. You know, we have huge issues at play for national security, government employees, and, and the protection of our intellectual property and our, our actual corporeal safety. And a carrier is likely going to get a little fine. We're going to charge you a dollar for every time this was sold. So give us thousands of dollars. <laughs> and that, that way you'll know never to do this again, wireless carrier. <laughs> From Peta, un, uneducated or willfully ignorant. And Rain327 says, 
Why not both? I was exactly. I was. I was definitely going to say por qué no los dos. Um, it, it's uh, it's disappointing. I feel our politicians would probably get savvier about these sort of technology issues if their constituents were asking about these issues more. Constituents are largely turning to major media organizations for their nightly news. And those are the types of resources that very rarely in depth cover this kind of geeky stuff because geeky stuff isn't salacious, it's geeky. So average consumers probably won't care about this unless we can put Facebook and privacy in the title of a two minute broadcast and make an infographic with a hacker with matrix code in the background. That's about the amount of patience or the amount of attention that local news producers have for this content. So unfortunately, consumers don't really get a good look at what this stuff actually means over the long term. Because consumers aren't demanding more education on these topics from their elected officials, elected officials can just turn to the lobbyists and say, we don't know what to do, what, what's gonna be good for the industry, write up the legislation and I'll sign off on it and I'll, I'll deliver it. And I feel we've gone too long with that being the system that operates for the future of our economy, the future of our medical industry, the future of our education system, banking, everything is tech. We need to start leading better conversations with our family and friends. <laughs> Gary the fireman just throw Zuckerberg in jail for a week. <laughs> I mean, again, our, our current legal process, our current um, legislative process is having a really difficult time just understanding what, what laws might have been violated in situations like this, let alone untangling what is, a, what, what is true justice for setting that straight. So uh, moving right along, another political story that we've been, especially over these last couple weeks, just to touch on it, we're not going to spend too much time here, but this is coming direct from a Reuters feed uh, written up by Philip Blenkinsop. EU lawmakers with eye on Apple call for common mobile charger. Out of Brussels, EU lawmakers overwhelmingly called on Thursday for rules to establish a common charger for all mobile device makers across Europe, a drive that iPhone maker Apple has criticized. Members of the European Parliament voted by 582 to 40. One more time, those numbers, 582 votes for uh, and 40 votes against for a resolution urging the European Commission with drafts EU laws to ensure that EU custom consumers are no longer obliged to buy new chargers for each new device. The Commission should adopt new rules by July, the law lawmakers res resolution said. The, the article goes on to talk about the enormous weight of using uh, the enormous weight of e-waste that's been generated, uh, especially since 2016. We've been tracking how much garbage ends up in landfills or doesn't end up in landfills. And uh, again, we've been focusing this conversation a lot because the industry is already largely moving towards the USB-C connector being something of a universal connector. It can be used to plug in displays. It can be used to power Thunderbolt. It can be used for a variety of uh, uh, master-slave devices in a USB protocol. There's very little that this port design can't accomplish. So at some point, we really should look at one connector to rule them all and making the standard as sort of globally broad, uh, as broadly implemented as possible. So much so that even the iPad now uses USB-C. It's just the iPhone is a dominant sales force for Apple. And a part of the market that they've created is the licensing of the lightning connector for all of these individual um, accessories. You know, I've got all a, a desk full of these obnoxiously overpriced, fragile, limited uh, functionality dongles that you need to have with lightning connectors if you want your iPhone to actually approach being a pro device. USB-C would solve a lot of problems there. It would make your accessories much, much more compatible. Like you could buy one laptop hub 
and use it with your phone, your tablet, or your laptop. One purchase, as opposed to buying a handful of individual $30 to $50 dongles that have far limited more uh, far limited functionality. And we've also broken down those arguments. Apple saying, well, we need innovation. Apple has not innovated. The, the Lightning Connector is not innovative. The Lightning Connector is stuck on its original spec. And at the time, that was USB 2. So if you have an iPhone, you have a USB 2 connected computer. Of course, file transferring over Wi-Fi is gonna be faster for a lot of people on AirDrop because when you plug in a cable, you're stuck at USB 2. <laughs> Again, we want to express this geeky stuff to consumers to understand these things because uh, an, I, uh, an Android device, a modern Android flagship is connected over USB 3. And that brings all of the functionality that USB 3 would bring to a laptop. If you want multiple USB IO, card readers, ethernet, if you want HDMI output, all of that is achieved directly through one cable connection at the same time. So USB-C is the final connector. I really feel like for technology products, we're gonna eventually arrive at USB-C saturation. And then from there, we'll, we'll be investing in wireless solutions. The, the part of this EU bill that got passed does have language pointing towards a future where we also certify a standard for wireless connectivity and wireless charging. It's not a part of this bill, but they're, having that, they're starting to have that conversation now. And I feel like that's very important just to get ahead of the potential for a handful of reinventing the wheel faux standards, proprietary solutions that do the same thing, but make sure you don't have interoperability with different products and with different accessories. I feel it's very likely that Apple will be punitive in this and, and push more aggressively for an iPhone that has zero ports. But when that happens, that means your chargers get more expensive because they need to be Qi chargers. Your, um, you need to buy more of these types of more expensive solutions. And then the surrounding infrastructure of, of accessories, of microphones, of battery packs, everything gets adjusted for Apple's move against a cable. And when Apple does it, Apple fans are gonna hem and haw for a minute and then just go and buy the new, the new products that don't have ports on them. And then every other manufacturer is gonna see that Apple is making a ton of money making people rebuy accessories that they don't really need to rebuy. And then Samsung's gonna follow them almost immediately after they make fun of them. You're gonna see a commercial in 2021 where Samsung makes fun of iOS sheep for not having ports on their phones. And then in 2022, they're gonna do the same thing on the note. <laughs> it's always the way that this goes down. Mm -hmm. uh, from, uh, from Mbuku replying to Geet Madden, the thing is what's the next best thing after USB-C? And again, I don't know that the USB-C connector finds any massive reinvention after we're done with USB-C. I really think at, at that point, the industry will sort of decide that we all need to spend more money to do stuff wirelessly. Or that if there are wires to plug in, it's sort of a wireless wired adapter kind of thing or pogo pins, we wanna avoid that. We don't want everything to be sort of built around proprietary dock connectors again. <laughs> From Memrangalat, uh, basically Apple wants money from MFI licensing. <laughs> I think that's pretty clear. I think it's very clear that they're looking specifically at not just your iPhone purchase, but you buy an iPhone and you want to plug in headphones, add $10. You buy an iPhone and you want to read a memory card, add $30. You know, it, it's that which also drove, I think, a number of their decisions on the MacBook. Apple is a company used to be very aggressive in pushing better technologies forward. We'll get rid of the floppy drive. We'll get rid of the optical drive because at the time in our industry, we had better solutions to get that kind of functionality done. Right now, the iPhone is horrifically behind for things like cabled connections. 
So you're, they're not driving innovation with the Lightning Connector. It's just they make way more money by making you buy properly licensed um, Lightning cables since they control the Lightning licensing and they can't control the USB licensing. From Zephyrus001, this, this is totally a fair point. USB-C is going to be a mess later on, like USB 3, 5 gigabit, 3.2 Gen 1, and now USB 4 versus Thunderbolt. So we're in for some teething pains. I don't think anyone believes that this is going to be a perfectly smooth transition as future specs of USB are arrived at. But what we're hoping for, and I feel we will have a better chance at arriving at this type of consumer understanding, is Thunderbolt becoming the more broad global PC standard with various flavors of USB directly implemented on, on our mobile devices, on our phones and on our tablets, until we can find some way of incorporating that kind of bus speed on a mobile device. By the time we get to a future Thunderbolt 4, I would hope there is some consideration for incorporating that into a phone, but we'll have to see. At least something like this is going to guarantee, the EU's legislation here is going to guarantee that at least the same connector is being used. And hopefully that motivates cable manufacturers and charger manufacturers and battery manufacturers to start playing within a more rigidly defined specification. And from there, we'll actually arrive at the dream for consumers that this stuff gets easier when you just can just blindly plug one cable into any device that you want to plug it into. We got some time to go, but having the iPhone on that standard and having the iPhone on that spec would actually move us forward faster for that type of agreement in this marketplace. <laughs> Um, from Mim from Mimrangalot, I feel what the EU is doing is to ensure less tech waste as dead lightning cable repurchasing will go away. Um, I, I, there was also the argument Apple made, like, oh, if you take away the lightning connector, then people need to buy all new adapters and chargers, which doesn't really vibe because that's not what happened when Apple got rid of the dock connector. It's not like Apple got rid of the dock connector and everyone immediately got iPhones with lightning connectors. We're just going to have that transition point where we're going to have a number of lightning products out in the marketplace. And eventually, from one year to the next, new consumers will be on USB-C, but we're still going to have all of those products around. It's just hopefully over that year or two, as consumers are buying new phones and replacing their lightning connector devices, exactly what Memranglot is saying here, that because we're on a USB-C spec, Hopefully, people are able to buy more common accessories for all of their products. And like I said before, this has more. This this has ramifications for more than just phones. Also, tablets and laptops and desktops. The number of different cables I need to have on my desk for all of the various products around us. And the audio industry is a major problem. Has a major problem with this stuff too. USB-C could start moving us in the right direction. <laughs> so rain three three two seven so the real question is how do you regulate for the purpose of providing for some type of standard without stifling creativity and innovation and that's a very difficult question the as we've we talked about on this on the, on the podcast before i think most of us in the tech space would prefer governments not legislate products like gadgets. But at some point, our only corrective action in a market like the iPhone as, as an industry is to utilize some kind of legal action to try and affect the change that we'd want to see. I'm not sure what kind of innovation we might want to seek for plugging a cable into a computer. I mean, I mean, I really want us to think about this in the live chat and for those of you listening to this podcast later, what is it that the act of plugging in a cable really needs? 
one, I want the cable to be universally flippable, not like USB-A where you could only plug, it was a rectangle, but you could only plug it in in one direction. So Lightning fulfills that and USB-C fulfills that. It doesn't matter what orientation you plug the cable in. But then after that, what is it that we're looking for? What, what, what innovation might we stifle by saying we want you to use one oval connector? They're not actually managing, the EU is not gonna be responsible for setting the standards for the technology. That's still gonna be the USB IF. So they're going to say, this is the spec for USB, now go and operate within this spec. But what the EU is mandating is everyone uses this oval connector. And from what we've seen, the USB plug, USB-C plug can work for monitors, can work for audio gear, can work as a direct pass-through for audio signals. It could replace a headphone jack. It can work for uh, uh, um, storage devices. It can work for data communication transfers like Ethernet. It, it can replace all of these different things. It has the, the it has extra pins where you can enable all of this additional functionality. It can work for Thunderbolt as a specification. It can work for HDMI and DisplayPort as a specification. It can work for USB as a specification. So I completely appreciate the fear of what if government stops us from getting a next generation cable? Something that's gonna work even better. But I want us to realistically sit down and think, what would that be? <laughs> because I, I, I really don't think we're in too dangerous a territory here. Were this the day of micro USB versus the Apple 30 pin dock connector, there might have been some greater concerns. But we've all kind of arrived at one cable standard. Even Apple has arrived at this cable standard. USB-C is the charger and data communication port on MacBooks. It is the port of preference on iPads. They're just holding out because of the money that they make on Lightning. And then everything else in this industry is pointing towards USB-C. Again, not as the standard of data communications, but as the shape of the plug. Whatever you attach to that plug, you know, go have fun, go nuts, go innovate. But let's all just get to the plug being the same. And I, that, that I, I agree with. But I totally appreciate concerns when governments get involved to say, you've got to make your gadget like this. More often than not, that is a broadsword hacking at the industry as opposed to the fine, delicate scalpel of adjustment that regulation should be. Uh, for Matt Tyler, standard, standardization of a device's fully compatible watts charger should be done as well. Think of all the e-waste on chargers because people get a crap one in the box, but the better one, but the better one, buy the better one and throw the crap one away. And actually, I think this is in part what the EU is looking to do. Um, I think manufacturers are actually going to like this. The, the longer term play seems to be pointing towards when you buy a new phone, you won't get a charger in the box. You know, Apple and Samsung are going to love that. They get to save a couple more pennies per phone sold, and they don't have to charge you less. It's not like they're going to take five bucks off the price of your phone because they're not going to include a charger in the box. But because of that, we're probably going to be working USB power delivery, USB PD, as the universal global standard. And then if you want, you can go and buy a OnePlus charger for faster charging or a Huawei charger for faster charging based on their proprietary spec. But everything's gonna be USB plug to USB plug. That, I don't believe that's actually been legislated, but I think that that's what they're hoping to encourage the, the smartphone and the gadget market to accomplish. Oh, and hey, Tech Love and Mama sending a heart and sending a wave in the live chat. Everyone say, hey, Tech Love and Mama, she's fun, you should be. Checking her out. She's cool. <laughs> wow, we've got some deep conversation going on about audio quality and fidelity and FLAC files and some other stuff too. So, um, 
yeah, we should probably move on. Uh, that's the EU. I didn't really mean to spend that much time on it, but we also have two stories back to back. Again, you know what? Let me try and minimize these. We've been talking about these quite a bit. The geeky, techy, political, law, tech and politics kind of stuff. Um, let me throw these links in the live chat. And like I said, they'll be in the show notes for this article, uh, for this, uh, for this broadcast. Two very important stories that I'd really like you to read up on. The ramifications of both of these will have far reaching in impacts on not just gadget security, but kind of internet security as a whole. And if we want to talk about governments legislating things that they don't really have a good grasp on, these are the two stories that should wig us out, that our lawmakers should be better educated about this stuff. Excuse me. Um, first of all, let's screen share this story from Motherboard. Government report reveals its favorite way to hack iPhones without back doors, written up by Todd Feathers. The U.S. government is once again reviving its campaign against strong encryption, demanding that tech companies build back doors into smartphones and give law enforcement easy, universal access to the data inside them. At least two companies that sell phone-cracking tools to agencies like the FBI have proven they can defeat encryption and security measures on some of the most advanced phones on the market. And a series of recent tests conducted by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, reveal that while there remain a number of blind spots, the purveyors of these tools have become experts at reverse engineering smartphones in order to extract troves of information off the device and the apps installed on them. Um, Motherboard's write-up here is very well researched. There are great links to previous law enforcement cases like the San Bernardino, San Bernardino shooter case, which we happened, which happened here locally and had a lot of political ramifications for smartphones. We recently talked about even the Trump administration, President Trump himself talking about Apple as if Apple owed the U.S. government back doors because, because the Trump administration tried to help Apple with tariffs against China like a direct quid pro quo, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, kind of disclosure from the president of the United States as it related to Tim Cook and Apple. But the realities of this um, have, have always been, and I feel always should be a cat and mouse game. We build better encryption for consumers, and then law enforcement builds a better battering ram to knock it down. And that's really the only correct way moving forward. You try your best to protect the data that you can. Everyone gets afforded the same privacy. You don't have to give up access to your home unless there's a warrant. You know, and if you don't uh, acquiesce to being served a warrant, then they come in with a battering ram and knock your door in. That should be the relationship that we have where someone cannot be compelled to give up their own private headspace information. And increasingly that headspace information lives on mobile devices. Even scarier in a world where your face is often the key to unlock your phone. Is this really a password, as I wipe my hand in front of my face here, when it's publicly accessible information? You know, if I walked around with a name tag that had my phone's pin on it, I don't feel like law enforcement should have to honor my request that they don't look at that name tag to look at my pin. So check out this this uh, Vice article, this Motherboard article, because it also highlights because of the big claims that Apple has made about privacy and security, that actually makes them the biggest single target. You don't have competition in iOS. It's only what Apple makes. So once there's an exploit found in an Apple product, the entire iPhone generation is compromised. We've actually arrived at a place where individual Android manufacturers are more secure through obscurity. It's the flip side of the Windows versus Mac OS argument. Because Mac only operates at around 10% of the market, there are so many more security threats and uh, malware written for Windows PCs because you have a much larger base of consumers to attack. Since Apple represents something like 
40% of the North American smartphone sales, they are the bigger target for companies who are starting to reverse engineer Apple security. A modern day Android phone, a modern day Android flagship phone, because it is not an iPhone, likely has far less attention paid to it by these institutes that are looking to crack open gadget security and encryption. If you care about really locking down your data from any kind of exploit, funnily enough, you might actually be safer using a modern day Android phone. In fact, this article does go on to quote um, some of the security researchers saying, uh, law, excuse me, law enforcement side of this saying, well, we feel like some of these Android manufacturers are making their phones purposely difficult to break into just to spite us law enforcement officers. So if you care about that, that might guide a purchasing decision. They're having a harder time cracking your galaxies and your LGs and your motos. You should know. <laughs> so Mbuk is uh, saying, ooh, the US is trying to become a surveillance state. They really are, because immediately following up that story, we've got this article from Gizmodo, which I also already linked in the live chat. Let me uh, screen share this. Lindsey Graham is quietly preparing a mess of a bill trying to destroy end-to-end -end encryption, written up by Del Cameron and Tom McKay. Again, not to go too, too deep into this article, uh, I, I got to commend, uh, Del Cameron and Tom McKay did a phenomenal job of writing up this story and linking to very specific articles relating to this conversation that we've been having over some time. This is not directly, we want you to build a backdoor into a laptop or into a smartphone. This bill, which is being called the Earn It Act, E-A-R-N-I-T Act, is making an argument that end-to-end -end encryption on the internet serves the interest of people who peddle trafficking, child abuse, and the scariest aspects of the most nefarious dark web types of scary things on the internet. I'm choosing my words very very carefully because this video is probably already gonna get demonetized on YouTube. I'd like to not just sledgehammer my entire channel by using specific words like P-O-R-N. That probably just did it right there. So because of that, they're looking to dismantle, uh, <laughs> they're looking to dismantle encryption on the internet. Um, we, we talked about this before. It's, um, what, how, what is this? Uh, eliminating abuse and rampant neglect of interactive, uh, sorry, let me say the Eliminating Abuse and Rampant Neglect of Interactive Technologies Act. It's the Earn It Act. So we've, we've talked about Section 230 of the, uh, the, the media protections. Um, it's, a, it's a section which says an internet, a company that distributes information on the internet is not responsible for the content that gets distributed. So YouTube is not responsible for someone uploading hate speech to YouTube. Basically, this would be a punitive and a dismantling of those types of internet protections. We've talked about this on the podcast. I do feel there needs to be some market correction for a company like Facebook, which hides behind, we are not a publisher we just disseminate information that other people share, but we also have editorial control over what they share and we can take down content when it bothers our advertisers. But you can't legislate us like a newspaper because we're not a newspaper, but we totally control content like a newspaper to make more money. So tech companies have been having playing it both ways, but what this Earn It Act would do would also be dismantling that Section 230 to say, if part of your internet service delivers end-to-end -end encryption communication for your users, 
you would be in violation of this act. You would no longer have the protections of Section 230, and we would shut your site down. I, I don't understand. Well, I mean, I do. But just to posit the question out in the air. In the older days of politics, this to me really would have felt like a liberal initiative. You know, when Tipper Gore was out there complaining about rap lyrics being too saucy for white people, that's the nanny state, right? It is a little more concerning that these types of initiatives are now coming from the GOP. That whole era of the faux libertarian, uh, pick yourself up by your bootstraps, government should not get involved in private businesses, government should not be legislating what I do privately in my own home, that, that, that kind of core group of conservatism is now not being listened to in the GOP. When Lindsey Graham is out there with very little knowledge of how this industry works. I can't believe Lindsey Graham is well-versed on this stuff at all. Talking about how we need to get rid of encryption on web services, he completely misses the entire global market of data security, data privacy, medical records, what makes something HIPAA compliant as we're trying to network hospitals together so that we have easier access to your data, banking information, educational information, the privacy of minors, all of these things come down to consumers having tools like encryption. <laughs> so it's getting real dark out there. It's getting real messy and we need some kind of counter conversation because I mean, for as much as I love that Gizmodo has done a wonderful job of writing this up and a number of news outlets have loosely touched on this, it's still being couched in the mainstream media as this is going to be a way to further protect people against the trafficking of sexual assault victims, which potentially that could work, but I seriously doubt it. And in, in a much the same way as you might be sort of an advocate for fire, for firearms and you would make an argument like making fire alarm, uh, uh, firearms illegal is only going to mean that criminals have fire firearms. Um, making encryption illegal is only going to empower the people who are doing the dirtiest, nastiest things privately through encryption. So that's bad. <laughs> Gary the Fireman, Kate McKinnon is the best Lindsey Graham ever. <laughs> yeah, actually, I mean, her turn on Saturday Night Live. It's funny how, like, basically they just turned to Kate McKinnon for everyone now. Uh, who, who do we need? I mean, Lindsey Graham? Uh, is Kate McKinnon in the sketch? No, let's get Kate to do it. <laughs> From the Meringlot. Instead of using those those words, how about using euphemisms like badunkadunk? Oh no. See again, I don't want to minimize the, the the pain and the abuse and I want to have a grown-up conversation about I mean the, the the darkest and the worst aspects of human behavior which are empowered by our hobby. We need to have that grown-up conversation. I want these amazing tools in my phone. Unfortunately, that means someone who's a bad actor, someone who's an evildoer will also have the same access to those tools. But I don't believe the right answer is taking those tools away from the consumers, from the vast majority of people who will do right by those tools, who will use those tools responsibly and will use those tools to protect themselves. Because the people who will do wrong by those tools, the evildoers, will still do evil. We won't stop that segment of our, of our society by completely eradicating the access to those tools from people that can use them responsibly. Gary the Fireman, get D. Snyder to testify again. Uh, unfortunately, I, I think we're, we're kind of past the reasoned argument when the counterpoint argument to these types of situations isn't coming from reason. It's coming from power, control, and financial gain. <laughs> the Sentinel 909, that's like saying cars can kill people, evildoers can get cars, ban all cars. And I think cars are a wonderful, um, a wonderful example. 
when cars are accidentally involved, excuse me, when a vehicle is accidentally involved in loss of life, we come up with a huge industry of support around vehicles with insurance, with safety features on vehicles. Every year we work to improve the survivability of these types of situations. And to your point, uh, Sentinel 909, we don't get rid of the car. We make the car better and we make the infrastructure surrounding the car more accessible and more punitive for people who do wrong by that. When someone intentionally uses a vehicle to create harm or to create chaos, we change society around that vehicle. Look at all of the public institutions and public meeting places that now have some form of barricade that would prevent a vehicle from running roughshod through a public, a public space, through a demonstration, through a protest, or through a march. Look at the, the changes in behavior that we've enacted around things like fun runs and 5Ks and marathons. Society made an adjustment and we made it better. And we, we tried. We're never gonna fully get rid of the crazy person who will eventually use a car or a truck to cause harm, but we don't just give up, <laughs> we try. And that to me becomes the main factor in this conversation. We don't get rid of encryption because a few bad people are using it nefariously. We work to make sure that the people who are using technology products are better protected against those, those bad actors and those evildoers. <laughs> Q3 Becker, make cars great again. <laughs> All right, um, one more story, and I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this because I actually have a video on this coming out soon-ish, but uh, Medium, uh, Elemental, beat me to the punch. So let me drop this in the live chat here. Uh, uh, this is part of a, uh, I'm gonna be trying to pick out a hearing topic for every week's podcast for hashtag 2020 hearing. And Medium beat me to a conversation about something I, I, I'm going to be talking more about. And that is the topic of hitting, hidden hearing loss. Andrew Zaleski, Z Zaleski, you might be losing your hearing and you don't even know it. Uh, this article is a wonderful write-up explaining a concept which can be a little difficult to wrap your brain around. But take a stroll down a busy street and the sounds are everywhere and even more pernicious to your hearing than you might expect. Consider that, considering that normal speaking volume registers just 60 decibels, cars honking, sirens wailing, that's 85 decibels of sound. An approaching subway train launches 100 decibels into the air. Think it's safer in the, sur in the suburbs? A leaf blower, 85 decibels. The dog who decides to bark in the car, 110. And lest we forget about AirPods, those minuscule technological gadgets can send pulsing waves at decibel levels above 100 directly into your ear. Cranking up the volume of music on an iPhone is safe for just 10 minutes before you risk serious, permanent damage to your hearing. <laughs> There is a concept that we, I started a conversation on with um, Dr. Grimes, uh, the head of audiology at UCLA, one of the top audiologists in the country, and she helped break down this concept. Hidden hearing loss is a degradation of hearing at very specific frequencies, which doesn't necessarily manifest during a hearing test in a controlled environment. Short story long, I can go to an audiologist today sit in an, an enclosed soundproof room and score super high. I score phenomenally well, above average for a man my age. And then as soon as I'm out of that controlled environment and I go to a cafe with tile floors and glass, glass you know, surfaces and a room full of people clinking glasses and cups and plates and mugs and I can't hear human speech. If I'm out with you in a noisy environment, I'm reading your lips as much as I am actually hearing the words that you say. And that is an anecdotal but practical example of hidden hearing loss. And because it's very difficult to diagnose in a doctor's office, 
we actually don't have great data on how many people might be affected by that. While we know that there is a substantial rise in hearing loss across all ages and across all demographics. In our modern society, all of the things around us, hand dryers in a bathroom, the coffee grinder you use to start your morning off with, are all emanating substantially higher levels of noise than we really think they are. And it's hard to guarantee that something like that might be safe. When you go and test a hand dryer, one of those Dysons, so it's got those air blades that kick on and, and wick moisture off of your fingertips really, really quickly while throwing bacteria into the air because of the moist environment. The sound level of those has to be measured and has to be certified, but it's measured often in something like a sound controlled or anechoic chamber, which doesn't resemble the tile floor environment of a public restroom. And when those sound waves bounce off of surfaces and they collide with each other, they actually get stronger in a lot of cases. We don't know how much damage might be uh, caused by our interactions with just daily life uh, uh, gadgets and machinery. And we're coming to, to find that a lot of the things that we took for granted as age-related hearing loss really don't have anything to do with our age. In, in cultures or societies where they live a more agrarian lifestyle without so much technology bombarding their senses, older people suffer almost no permanent hearing loss compared to younger members of their adult, uh, uh, adult collective. There is some age degradation, but it's not loss. It's not like hearing just disappears. So then we look at the, the software ramifications of this not just your ears not functioning, dementia, dementia rates skyrocket alongside hearing loss. So losing your hearing and your ability to interact with other people causes your brain to degrade. <laughs> it, it affects your balance. It affects your motor skills. There are so many far reaching issues that our just general society are having an impact on our ability to live our lives. So I've linked that story. It's going to be in the show notes on somegadgetguy.com. Please give it a read. This is going to be another topic I'm going to be following up on as a video for hashtag 2020 hearing. And I feel it's something we need to be dedicating more conversation towards. We've got two whole generations of people and a new generation of consumers coming up, little kids, that are going to have to pay for all of this damage being done. And I'm not sure... I'm not sure we have the social institutions in place to really help these people. I fear we're gonna have an, an, a lost generation of older folks coming up very, very soon. And that's not gonna be easy to deal with. From LFA Reviews, one of my absolute favorite headphone reviewers and someone who has joined this conversation on hearing loss. Uh, he says, I'm pretty sure I'm affected by hitting, hidden hearing loss when I'm in loud environments. Um, from Steve, Q3 Becker, earpods have been a thing for a while now. From the rise of the iPod, which had an open ear earbud design, to today where Apple still, with the exception of the AirPods Pro, having kind of an in-ear seal, not the same as like a true inner ear um, earbud, <laughs> excuse me, uh, our, our rates of hearing loss correlate we are not saying causation, but they correlate very closely with the rise of the MP3 player to the rise of the smartphone. From Peta, I've been to concerts where the bathrooms are louder than the band because of those dryers. Um, and there's also like, it's really scary when you consider kids being shorter and being at eye level with those, those uh, hand dryers. It sounds so silly. You go into a bathroom, dry your hands, big deal. Okay, got a little loud. But a kid is at the height with the sound pressure to cause lasting damage in those few seconds of using a hand dryer. And that's what we're raising our kids to interact with. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, please, please give it a read. Please continue to, to check out this kind of information. I'm gonna be sharing more of this information and talking about ways that we can hopefully do a bit better. Uh, I, I think it's always worth just walking around with a pair of earbuds 
If, if, if traffic is getting kind of loud around you, don't let your ear get comfortable with that louder noise of cars around you, but pop in a pair of earbuds. Even if you're not listening to anything, it'll take 10 decibels off of the noise around you and make it just a bit more comfortable. You know, just for that walk that you might have as you go through a busy intersection, it can help. And, and you'll feel better. I go to movies now and I wear earplugs. One, because people never learned how to chew with their mouths closed, but two, because movie theaters crank the volume way too high. All of these interactions, all of these, all of these individual moments add up and they accumulate pretty, pretty heavy. From Mbuk, uh, I can't go back to open ear earbuds, rubber tips, ANC, or bust. Also look at foam. And if you've got the money, molds, custom molded ear tips. I, I always have my Mi Audio uh, Pro monitors within reach. The cable got a little tangled up. So this is a great argument in favor of True Wireless. But you know, these are molded to my biology. There will be no more comfortable fit and no better seal around the entire ear cavity and a ballpark price in the range of a premium Bluetooth headset. So you got those Sonys, you got those big old fat comfy Sony cans, maybe you got some Bear Dynamic Lagoons, custom molded ear tip earbuds, pretty close, pretty close to that same price, maybe a little cheaper depending on where you can get them done. Real good, Real good for you, more comfortable. You can listen quieter, it's good times. Okay. It's a part of the podcast where now that we're done with the plug for hashtag 2020 hearing, real, uh, I want to spend a little time talking about the subreddit for this podcast. Every podcast has a subreddit, some subreddits uh, really about linking interesting stories and uh, topics to talk about. Some are just fan sites where people can have conversations or tell a podcast host that they're pretty keen. My subreddit for the SGGQA podcast is a, uh, is a resource to share and help promote content creators you feel deserve more attention. I want to find more voices in the technology conversation. I want a more well-rounded discussion of all the tech, to tech topics out there. And even if a channel's decently sized in this world of YouTube algorithms, we really want to help move the message along. We really want to help promote the content that we care about. It's not enough to just passively view, you know, watch a video and say, oh, well, that was neat, and then not interact. If you want that person to continue making videos or continue writing articles about things you care about, give them a share, give them a tweet, give them a thumbs up, drop them a comment. Active participation is what's necessary so that the market isn't dominated by a handful of the most popular, huge, uh, YouTube channels out there. So my subreddit, reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles is one resource. It grows every week. We picked up 10 subscribers last week. That's the most we've ever picked up. 10 actual subscribers, net, net 10. We actually pick up more, but you know, it's, it's Reddit. So a couple people unsubscribe, a couple people subscribe. It's always been a net positive, but we picked up 10. We went from 605 to 615. I'm telling you guys, this is for reals reddit.com slash rss slash glowing rectangles. These are the top three stories as voted on by the community there. And number one with a bullet, Matt Tyler, totally picking a uh, tech spurt. Now this is a video about the Motorola One Hyper, but Matt wrote like a paragraph about tech spurt because tech spurt's pretty cool dude. Um, honestly, you should be subscribed to tech spurt and this is a great channel, uh, but we'll work on Matt to work on his titles, because really I'd like to know, the, the title is Motorola One Hyper Review. So if you were searching for a Motorola One review, you would find, check out Techspert on YouTube, you get videos like this, amazing reviews, and this Motorola One Hyper Review is awesome, you won't see reviews on these phones anywhere else. Um, I agree with the sentiment, I totally do, but that's, that's not the title of the video. <laughs> but number one with a bullet, uh, and, and deservedly. I've reached out to Motorola. I used to have a really good contact at Lenovo. I don't know that I'm gonna be getting my hands on this anytime soon, but if we're looking for companies to help shake up the Apple-Samsung dichotomy, 
Moto has been kicking around as a consistently solid player, especially in the lower mid-range. For me, I keep coming back to the Motorola G series being a fantastic option for a more cost conscious um, individual. <laughs> Matt Tyler, damn it. <laughs> and Sentinel 909, I like Techspert's humor is killer too. LFA reviews, his comment section is a whole other matter. I mean, like, again, I've been trying to give up on all of this common comments and commentary. I, I get mean, um, I get really mean when I spend too much time in my YouTube comments these days, which makes me sad because the whole reason I started producing videos was to have conversations. And I wanted to talk to people in the comments, increasingly becoming a no-go. Uh, the number two spot, um, this is unfortunate. I, uh, this is a jerk who makes it up into the top three of the subreddit way too often. Um, I, I kind of hate his face and uh, it's a very punchable face. And oh, I wear cool hats. Uh, but some jerk made a review of the one more true wireless ANC in-ear headphones. And you know, he has the gall to talk about how terrible the name is. Um, because like one more wouldn't, wouldn't make a good product and name it appropriately. Like he knows better than one more what they should name uh, their products. This one guy, I don't know who he thinks he is, but he's a jerk. He somehow made it to the number two spot in uh, on the subreddit. But then number three, this just made me happy because it's a tiny little channel, Patreon supported. And if you're a Trek nerd like I am, oh, Aditya Anil, another Juan bites the dust. Oh, kudos. Beautiful. I love a good Juan pun. Good job. And I knew this would get fat produce. So Andrew Wallace, you know, just kind of lurking in the live chat. Um, Junk ball transmission. If you're a Trek nerd, you absolutely need to be subscribed to Junk Ball. I'm hoping we see some coverage from Junk Ball on the new Picard show that's coming out. But he also does these retrospectives, and he did one on the USS Excelsior. This isn't just, oh, the USS Excelsior was a ship in the late 22nd century of Starfleet that had bigger nacelles and was sabotaged by Scotty in Star Trek Three, and then Sulu was the captain in Star Trek Six. He actually digs up like old production photos. He talks about the model that they used for photography and when that shifted over into being a CG um, type of ship. And, and also this one hit close to home because the Excelsior is my all time favorite Starship design. The first time I saw the Excelsior in Star Trek Three. And this is after years of being a Trek fan. I loved the A refit for the motion pictures. The, the Enterprise is still like one of the most beautiful concepts in starship, spaceship science fiction history. And then I saw the Excelsior and it blew my mind. It is just, I, I think it's an amazingly beautiful um, fantasy space model. And, and just like everything. I've got like a little pewter Excelsior right up there on the shelf behind us. It's totally out of focus. You can't see it. It's only like this big. Um, but Junk Ball did a video on it and that hit our number three spot on our glowing rectangles. Probably not a video that you would have just normally seen in your YouTube feed, but we've got a ton of stuff like that. Um, just rounding out the rest of the top, top 10. $400 Bluetooth headphone comparison, the Bose 700 versus the Panda from Joshua Valour. Um, Gary explains a regular feature on glowing rectangles, Windows subsystem for Linux on ARM-based Surface Pro X. When Gary explains a concept, it's because it's a concept worth explaining. Uh, LFA also making it up there to talk about the Drop THX Panda. The Panda Wireless are getting some killer reviews if you're out there shopping premium headphones. Uh, Easy Computer Solutions finally got Android 10 on the LG G8, and I think he's got a counterpoint to some of my coverage on the desktop mode. Gadget Byte, an amazing channel, just doing an editorial on the future of Huawei. Sennheiser Headphones, um, Budget Smartphones, uh, Josh and, uh, um, uh, oh, I forgot her name, uh, Ilsa, Isa, Isa does it. <laughs> Um, uh, talking about some Qualcomm coverage, Note 10 versus Note 10 Lite, and Flossie. Last week, I put out a call that Flossie Carter was a YouTuber 
still pulling good numbers, but deserved more attention than he was currently getting through the YouTube algorithm. And someone shared his Motorola Razor 2020 unboxing, and it rounds out our top 10. Flossie Carter deserves more views on his content because he's been consistently a top tier producer and commentator in the world of technology. Bam, glowing rectangles. Someone sharing Flossie Carter content. That's awesome. And immediately after that, again, Jerkface McGee uh, talking to TK Our Bay. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, uh, we TK is reviving his Saturday morning with a side of tech podcast. And I was... Uh, I, I was honored to rejoin the relaunch of his, uh, his weekly show. So you can catch that there too. So folks, there's a ton. I, I just, uh, I, last year, I really seriously started trying to revive this subreddit idea week by week, day by day. We're picking up a few new subscribers. We're picking up a few new members. It's really encouraging to see that this hasn't been overloaded with Samsung and Apple commentary, that there's so much more to talk about in the world of tech than every single Samsung leak and rumor, and that we're seeing it from a hugely diverse international uh, collection of content producers. Reddit.com slash r slash glowing rectangles. Every week I say, if you've never been before, go check it out. You'll find a channel you've never seen before and you'll dig what they make. You'll find a new channel to subscribe to and you'll see content that doesn't show up in your YouTube subscription feed. It's a passion project of mine. We, we still need your support. We still need your help, your interaction. You know, Share something that you like, but then also stick around and drop some upvotes. Help with the popularity and visibility of some of these other producers. Drop some comments. The more interaction we see on glowing rectangles, the more potential we have to help blow up someone's channel, to help really find them a huge chunk of audience. It might get shared to another larger or more popular subreddit. It might show up more readily in search results. Um, I feel like we really can help circumvent the ugliest aspects of YouTube and Facebook style algorithms, but we need your active participation to do, to do that. Reddit.com slash r slash scrolling rectangles. And I thank you for your support. <laughs> from LFA Reviews, I absolute, I, I appreciate the love I get from the subreddit. And, and, you know, if you found someone on the subreddit, you know, tell them that you found them on the subreddit. I mean, that kind of stuff matters. Creators are going to want to know if people are finding their content through other places than just YouTube search. <laughs> Matt Tyler, Juan avoided the budget smartphone one by ASBYT because I posted it probably with a stupid title again. <laughs> yes, Matt also had another one in, in the top search results. He got two, but we're, anyways, we're gonna talk with Matt about, because again, I want you to look, like there's a trend. See, like there's the title of the video and then who made the video. And there's the title of the video and who made the video. And there's a title of the video, and then this person didn't share that it was Flossie Carter. Title of the video, who who shared, the, who made the video. And then there's, check out ASBYT on YouTube, a great creator, very honest and a little comical. This Lenovo review is a brilliant, is brilliant, a phone below 150 pound, higher specs than you might think, check it out. But the name of the video is Best Budget Smartphone of 2020, and it's by ASBYT. So again, I, I mean, I don't wanna pick on Matt because he's sharing really good stuff, but I'm just, there's a pattern. There's, there's a pattern of, of how things are shared and what you might search for. <laughs> Matt, at least I started with his YouTube name first this time. <laughs> Matt, I mean, again, you found great videos and deservedly, they were upvoted and, and they found great audience. In fact, I need to upvote this one by ASBYT. But again, um, we'll work on it. We'll, we'll talk offline. <laughs> Uh, Gary the Fireman, this is totally true. Gary the Fireman, Matt always finds the good-ish. But Steve, Q3 Becker, we need rules, man. Absolutely true. Okay. Um, before we get into the end gadget block, and this podcast is probably going to run a little longer than I intended it to, uh, this is the transition out of talking about the subreddit because we got some really sad news um, this last week. 
we care about commentary. We want more voices in tech. We want more perspectives, more points of view. And it's not that I want to make this a regular feature of the podcast because it's really sad. I don't want to celebrate the losses, but I want to acknowledge why it's so important to be an active participant and not just to passively consume. Because when we just passively consume, creators don't have the incentive to continue. Case in point, we got the news last week that one of my favorite podcasts is going back off the air. Uh, Adam Dowd is a very close personal friend of mine. We were... um, we, we were uh, sort of collaborators, uh, partners on the Pocket Now podcast. He was instrumental. Um, his, his insights were instrumental in me coming back to my own YouTube channel and to run a, a weekly show. And he was the producer for the Android Authority podcast and the Digit Daily. Um, oh, and then also the producer on the Sound Guys podcast, which I think is also getting hit by this too. So... This is the second attempt from Android Authority to bring back an Android-focused podcast. Um, Joe Hindi, Adam Dowd, and uh, I'm I'm spacing on the third name, Feist, uh, it was a great trio of passionate Android fans. I, I very much enjoyed their commentary, especially when I disagreed with them. Um, their last podcast, again, like everyone has to spend an inordinate amount of time explaining why LG is a failure in the market every single time it comes up. Um, and I very much disagree with their assessment on that. But the thing is, I I actually genuinely believed in how much they enjoyed the gadget landscape and they were a regular, um, weekly listen for me. It makes me sad that I won't have that back-to-back all about Android from the the Twit guys, um, Android Police. I like the Android Police podcast. And then Android Authority. That was my main Android trio. And now I lose an hour or 90 minutes of content that I used to really look forward to every week. For whatever reason, the powers that be involved in those media entities and those media properties decided that podcasting wasn't for them. They weren't getting the returns. They weren't getting the listens. They weren't getting the sponsorships to justify continuing to produce a a very well-polished weekly show with very informed commentary from people that spend time and are grossly undercompensated to deliver a high-quality product. And that's very frustrating. That that, that makes me very sad. That's That's not where we should be in this world of podcasting and media distribution and our ability to make our own things and not have gatekeepers tell us what we can and can't make and what we can and can't listen to. So tonight, I'm going to toast a really fancy whiskey, uh, a a really tasty bourbon to the Android Authority podcast. I hope you will similarly recognize a show that we won't get anymore. In whatever way that you might uh, want to partake, if it's a, if it's a tasty grown-up beverage, if it's a, uh, you know you want to go and get a get a delicious hot dog, I, I don't know what you do to uh, to commemorate the memory of something that you won't get anymore. But I hope you'll you also maybe reach out to Joe Hindi or Adam Dowd and just say, hey, sorry to hear, or I really enjoyed your show, or I hope you guys can find a way to make a comeback or something. Because those are guys that really put a lot of passion into what they made. And I don't think they, as a content creator, let me say personally, I don't know about them specifically, but personally, it doesn't take much to reinforce that it's worth continuing. But it does take something. It only takes a couple people you know, I have this live chat right now where I absolutely adore the interaction and the conversations we have while I'm in the middle of rambling on in a podcast. And that's my weekly refuel. <laughs> like, if I don't get this, it becomes much harder to continue producing throughout the week. Just some acknowledgement that there's an interaction and a conversation happening, and it's not just me yelling and shouting into the ether. 
And I think even though this show is on, it is out, the show is now finished um, in its second run, their second attempt at a podcast, I think they'd still want to know. I think they'd still want to know that there were people out there who were listening or who appreciated the work that they did, or will even just be sad to know that it's gone, even if they weren't diehard consumers or listeners or fans of their product. Hit them up. Give them a thumbs up or tell them some gadget guy sent you or something. But I think they deserve better than this. My opinion. <laughs> I got some F in the live chat. And and again, I, I really appreciate it. Send on 909, man, that's a damn shame. Um, Frat Produce, I'll raise my glass of Lafroy tonight at the end of a great podcast. Um, salute. Matt Tyler, I'll raise a, a Mega Pickle mug. You know, let me finish off the water I've got in Mega Pickle Green so I can go over to Mega, Mega Pickle Black. Oh, man. Aditya and Nil. I mean, I do like a hot chocolate. <laughs> so Aditya and Nil, toast, toast a hot chocolate to the memory of a great podcast. Okay, we're into the gadget block. Um, we got about a half hour here. And I want to wrap up with the BlackBerry news real quick. Um, I want to share this in the live chat. There have been a couple write-ups on it, but I really just want to share the direct numbers. And so I'm not going to break down all of the individual sales and statistics, but I think it's important just to kind of get a sense of where we're at. Um, for all of the market right now, focusing on a very limited number of manufacturers, only top tier popular products really get the coverage, the long-term coverage that um, every gadget probably deserves. IDC put out numbers on worldwide tablet shipments, and now they're continuing to decline in the fourth quarter of 2019. Um, the company that is best maintaining its market and is actually growing year over year in the percentage of tablets sold, even though the entire tablet market is somewhat in decline, Apple continues to sort of absorb the, the bigger and bigger share of tablet purchases. And I think rightfully in part, if one company, we could point to one company that was taking the tablet market most seriously, I, I think we could all safely point to Apple. I've actually been very impressed with the, uh, the shift to the iPad Pro. Out of, I really wish they would come out with an iBook, make an iPad OS powered laptop without a separate keyboard, make it like the old iBooks, you know, make it a consumer, um, a notebook style PC environment. Because I think the software for iPad OS shows a beautiful midpoint in power performance and functionality. And it addresses all of the issues that I've got with iOS, the multitasking performance, split screen performance, the IO using USB-C so you can connect accessories properly. It, it's making a really solid argument for someone who might not need a MacBook Pro, but still wants to get a pretty heavy level of mobile computing accomplished on a larger screen than a phone. And why I get so excited about things like the next dock, powering a laptop style form factor but with the phone that already lives in my pocket. So I, I'd recommend checking out those numbers just, just to get a, get a lay of the land. I like looking at this kind of data because I worry Android manufacturers might miss, might miss the idea. Why I feel things like the Galaxy Fold and the Huawei uh, it, Mate X as folding tablets that turn into clumsy phones will miss the boat on what consumers care about. An awkward square Android tablet doesn't really get consumers excited. And we see pretty good numbers that consumers are increasingly walking away from Android powered, larger screen portable computing devices. If we wanna regain that, we need to invest in the, in the solutions, in the services, in the software, in the environment, the power, the performance, to make those more exciting to consumers, along with the advertising, because, I mean, let's face it, tablet commercials for Android products, you don't see those. You do see iPad commercials. 
an iPad ends up in movies as the, the most desired technological product that consumers can invest in. Where's that? There's that Disney movie, Noel, um, where it's, you know, about who succeeds Santa Claus. And it's got, what's her name from those uh, girl acapella movies? Um, Anna Kendrick. And it's the running joke throughout the entire movie that all of the elves know that all the kids on the good list want iPads for Christmas. You know, like that that mind share, that free advertising, it's probably not even free advertising. I, I bet you money was exchanged just to mention iPad in a Disney movie. Reinforces the product dominance. So to overcome that, manufacturers need to do more than just make a good product, but they still need to make a good product. And I feel like a folding tablet isn't gonna get consumers on board the next phase of mobile computing. And DTNL, pitch perfect, thank you. Completely brain locked on, I, at least I recovered and remembered her name was Anna Kendrick. Um, but yeah, I, the first pitch perfect movie is a guilty pleasure of mine and I couldn't remember the title. Um, <laughs> Matt Tyler, 120,000 uh, pounds sterling for every mention of Apple. But yeah, check out those numbers because I feel like we need to stay on top of that trend. And one of the reasons why we need to stay on top of that trend is because we want manufacturers to better fulfill some of these market gaps. Maybe it's folding, maybe it's not. If it's folding, we probably have to address the issues of durability because I think consumers are going to find it increasingly difficult to try out folding gadgets before they buy them. Um, case in point, uh, Andrew Wallace actually shared this on the Discord, and I had to share it here, where it was uh, originally shared. Oh, no. Come on. Hold on. Now I've got to get the link back. Dang it. Dun, 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 dun. No. I completely lost it. Hold on. This is going to take me a second to get it back. This is terrible podcasting. I'm the worst. Where, where did it go? There it goes, okay. No, dang it. Come on, Twitter. Okay, originally shared by Max Weinbach. Whew. Found it. Um, <laughs> Andrew Wallace shared this in, in our Discord. Uh, where was I? Yes, so if you wanna play with a folding Motorola Razor uh, and you go to Walmart, Walmart had a display. And if you were to go, this is what you would have found. Um, some. Uh, not long after this display went up, uh, the public basically shredding this plastic screen um, and destroying it. And this is what your Motorola Razor is gonna look like if uh, you let the general public handle it for any length of time. It's, um, it's not a good luck. Uh, <laughs> fat produce, hashtag people of Walmart. Excuse me. So I think this is a, I, I, I don't know. I mean, like to me, this is a little like the frustration we had with Apple circa the iPhone six. Remember, you know, will it bend, bend gate, you know, people would go into Apple stores and bend the iPhone six plus purposely and intentionally breaking it. But there was an actual manufacturing issue with that phone. It's just, it doesn't really manifest in the way that people would intentionally try to break the product. And I feel with folding phones, we have a similar issue and a similar problem that it's gonna be difficult to entangle what the real severity of that problem is. I don't think the consumer who might buy and own a Motorola Razor is going to face this level of destruction through general use. <laughs> For Matt Tyler, it looks like Zach at Jerry Rig Everything was in Walmart. <laughs> he did the burn test and the whole screen just ignited. Um, no, that's not what happened. That was, a, that was a cheap joke. But if you genuinely try to take care of a Motorola Razor, I doubt it's gonna look like this over the life of using that product. But putting it on display as a way that someone might be able to interact with the function of that gadget and that it so quickly ends up looking like that is really rough. Um, it's, it's hard to convey like what the look, th this is what 
that's going to look like or what it's going to accomplish. And again, it's why I'm so not positive on folding gadgets right now, fulfilling the daily driver companion computing that we rely on phones for while not living up to the same durability that we've come to accept as the modern smartphone. You know, it's made out of glass, but it's also water resistant and the battery sealed in, but you can put a case on it that should help protect it from drops. And you can use a screen protector that if you wanna keep the screen from getting scratched, all of those things disappear with a folding phone. And you get the novelty of a phone that bends, but we don't have a good answer for making it more durable or protecting it or keeping this kind of abuse from wrecking it. So, uh, case in point, we're pretty confident that Samsung unpacked, we're gonna see uh, our first hands-on with the Galaxy Z Flip. And the Galaxy Z Flip has already been leaked. So breaking my own rule about you know, every leak and rumor, there's a little video. Uh, ben Geskin on Twitter shared, what is this? 19 seconds of the uh, Galaxy Z Flip. And uh, it's this cute little pink metallic uh, reflective surface phone. He jams a thumb in between the two panels and it extends to be one of the tallest and skinniest looking phones I think we've ever seen but then folds up pretty flat for a gadget that, I don't know, it's comfortably square in the palm of his hand. We don't have a lot of details on what, um, on what the phone is really going to be, like what it's constructed, what it's made out of. Uh, there are rumors that Samsung might be working with <laughs> Matt Tyler. It looks good, but does it feel good in the hands? <laughs> well, I mean, considering that Samsung didn't make it out of uh, out of broken shards of glass, it probably feels pretty good in the hand. I know we'll have a lot of YouTubers commenting on the feel in the hand because that's really important gadget commentary in the modern smartphone era. Uh, but you know, looking at this video on a loop, uh, I'll be curious to see. The, the, one of the rumors is Samsung is working with a new manufacturing process for an ultra thin glass cover so that the glass can bend on the hinge. I don't know if that's what <clears throat> if that's what we'll get for the Z Flip or if what we'll get is another plastic screen device like the original Galaxy Fold. But this looks like a pretty functional product. Again, piggybacking on what Motorola did first with the Moto Razor. Um, I mean, it, it, it looks like the closest we'll get currently with our current manufacturing um, uh, experience for a device that can be a little bit smaller in your pocket and then can flip out and expand for a more normal smartphone screen. I'm a bit more positive on this form factor than the folding tablet, but um, I don't know. I, I, I really don't think that this is gonna be a viable consumer segment. I, I think in, in the next year, you're gonna look at folding phones out in the wild as someone showing off that they were able, able to spend a lot more on a more fragile device that does a little bit less than a top of the line, regular premium smartphone. So uh, we'll have to see. But, but reading up on the material science, if we can find a solution for glass, which can actually articulate, glass which is thin enough to flex, well, first of all, I'd wonder if glass that thin would actually be any more durable. Yeah, now I've got more questions than answers. I was about to say, oh, that could be really exciting because, you know, the science of that, and then, you know, you'd have a more rigid display, so you don't have to worry about poking. Like, you could make a note a pen, an S Pen function with that, but that's actually not true because you still probably wouldn't want a stylus point of pressure on an ultra thin articulating pane of glass. Yeah, now I'm confused all over again. I'm gonna have to read up on some of those white papers even more. <laughs> and from JMX Warrior, I prefer this look also over the fold. There's something in my brain about like, you know, you can have a normal sort of smartphone screen form factor that then just folds in half. 
And I think I kind of like the Moto Razor version a bit better where the screen that extends is thinner and that a bulk of the battery and radios is in the chin and in the bottom half so that it sort of sits a little bottom heavy in the hand. Um, I haven't spent any time playing with any of these, so I'm totally talking out my rear here, but that to me would be the best of all solutions. Um, it's still probably a little bit thicker when it's all folded up than a regular phone, but then expands and has one, one side that's a little thinner than the other to, to make it a bit lighter up top for it being taller and skinnier. In my brain, that makes sense. But again, I will, we'll have to play around with some of this stuff a bit more. Uh, Gadget Guy 2020, you know, just use a Q-tip as your stylus. And if you have a Galaxy Fold, that point of pressure from a Q-tip is still probably unadvisable. <laughs> Ah, uh, all right. So we're getting to the end of the show. We've got about 20 minutes here before I think we're at that two hour mark, which is the right time to do our final sort of uh, rest in peace for another, again, another bummer of a story. Breaking news this morning, it was announced at uh, 6 a.m. my time. I had, I had just started my first cup of coffee when the news uh, broke that uh, one of my favorite Alternative Communicator Solutions, the partnership between BlackBerry uh, as the, uh, the, the rights holder and the intellectual property owner of Amazing Keyboards, and TCL as the ODM, the manufacturer of the actual phone hardware, that that partnership will be ending. There will be no future designs for BlackBerry smartphones. There will be no more key series phones. So I'm, I've, if you're watching this, I'm holding up a BlackBerry Key 2. Um, I held on to the red version. I asked if they wanted it back and no one from TCL replied. So I guess I just get to keep this as an amazing collector's item. Um, it's, it's a stunning, it's a beautiful phone in black and red. But um, the, the BlackBerry brand is essentially defunct again for any kind of consumer facing solution. BlackBerry is a business has moved on to enterprise and software security and server side and messaging and all that fun stuff. Uh, kind of like HP tried to do back in the day and IBM is now more of a business uh, solutions focused company. And that's what BlackBerry is. They will not be uh, rejoining the consumer facing market. And I don't know if there are any other ODMs that they might do business with and it doesn't seem like they've kept any engineering in house. So when they stopped making Blackberries around the Passport and the Priv, I think all of those teams have left and someone please correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think that I am. I think all of the talent that used to make Blackberry phones in house has now gone on to greener pastures. So uh, just to screen share this, I, guess I, I find this is really sad. This was a competing a competing solution for a minority of consumers that needed or wanted something different than a glass slab smartphone. Uh, and, and the fact that this came in a tweet just kind of makes it a little, like, like they broke up with me over a te text message kind of a thing. Uh, let me expand this. This is a little longer, so I'm gonna take a, a sip of water here. Sorry, one second. And thank you for all of you in the live chat who are pressing F to pay respects. Um, I, I am actually a little, uh, a little more than just uh, upset about this development. When TCL Communication announced in December 2016 that we had entered into a brand licensing and technology support agreement with BlackBerry Limited to continue making new modern BlackBerry smartphones available globally, we were very excited and humbled to take on this challenge. Indeed, our key series smartphones, starting with the key one, were highly anticipated by the BlackBerry community. What made these devices great wasn't just the hardware developed and manufactured by TCL Communication, but also the critical security and software features provided by BlackBerry Limited to ensure these were genuine BlackBerry devices. The support of BlackBerry Limited was an essential element to bringing devices like, like Key One, Key Two, and Key Two LE to life, and we're proud to have partnered, partnered with them these past few years on these projects. We do regret to share, however, that as of, as of August 31st, 2020, TCL Communication will no longer be selling BlackBerry branded mobile devices. 
TCL Communication has no further rights to design, manufacture, or sell any new BlackBerry mobile devices. However, TCL will continue to provide support for the existing portfolio of mobile devices, including customer service and warranty service until August 31st, 2022, or for as long as required by local laws where the mobile device was purchased. And then they give some links where you can find more information on customer support. For those of us at TCL Communications who were blessed enough to work on BlackBerry Mobile, we want to thank all our partners, customers, and the BlackBerry fan community for their support over these past few years. We are grateful to have had the opportunity to meet so many fans from all over the world during our world tour stops. The future is bright for both TCL and BlackBerry, and we hope you'll continue to support both as we move ahead on our respective paths. From everyone who worked on the BlackBerry Mobile team at TCL over the, over the years, we want to say thank you for allowing us to be a part of this journey. And at Fat Produce, Crackberry Kevin must be absolutely crushed by this news. I'm not feeling great. Um, uh, Gadget Guy 2020, Palm, Windows Phone, WebOS, BlackBerry, RIP. Um, <laughs> from Ready409, I still won't sell my BlackBerry stocks. Good man, good man, sticking with it. Um, from DTNL, I was seriously looking at BlackBerry. We'll see if I can get my hands on a key two now for nostalgia and to honor their brief revival. Um, from Fat Produce, how can we support BlackBerry if they are defunct? And you kind of can't. I mean, I guess you could be a stockholder in BlackBerry Limited, but that's not a consumer facing business anymore. Um, <laughs> Gadget Guy 2020, the future is bright like a dead light bulb. Um, and Matt Tyler, 2022, Microsoft buys up what's left of BlackBerry. Uh, I shift the emoticon. And, and um, I've got a video coming out. It might be out tonight. If I can edit it really quickly, it might be out tomorrow morning. And I just feel like the smartphone as we know it is a stagnant and a dead product category. I'm going to say this in, in the video. I've written the script for it. But I want you to consider laptops. We don't blink. We don't, we don't argue with the idea of an extremely diverse and extremely competitive laptop market. It is exceedingly rare that one laptop manufacturer breaks over 30% of any of the sales market in a region for one fiscal quarter. But we've all kind of agreed that smartphones need to be one generic thing, one basic slab of glass. When I put out videos on Sony's, LG's, Alcatel's, um, branded carrier phones like the Revel, uh, the Blackberry, my Blackberry videos did really, really well for me on my personal channel. And I talk about those devices as if they deserve to exist. Not that I think everyone should buy them, but just that competition deserves to exist. I get a lot of positive feedback on that. I've, I've kind of picked on some other gadget reviewers in the past when they say things like, oh, well, no one comes to our site and reads, we don't get any traffic on LG or we don't get any traffic on, on HTC, or we don't get any traffic on BlackBerry. And then you go and look at their articles and it's article after article after article of trashing those brands and telling anyone who would buy them that they've made the wrong purchasing decision. And how, how why would you ever buy one of those products? Well, no, duh, that people don't want to go and read those kinds of articles about things that they might like. I think the, the most frustrating aspect of this was I, I don't feel that this phone, the BlackBerry Key 2 specifically, ever really got the fair consideration and the fair commentary that it really deserved. I think most of the coverage and most of the commentary that I've seen on products like the Key 2 were designed to highlight what it's not with very little discussion on what it actually is. This is not a premium multimedia device. The BlackBerry Key 2 is an excellent communicator. It really is. I mean, it's an absolutely phenomenal 
communication and text entry device. And it's okay for watching some video on, and it's mediocre for playing a lot of graphics intense games. And the headphone jack could be a bit better, but it's practical and it has a headphone jack, which a business user might care about. And it doesn't have all the same rated specs for, you know, dunking it in a bucket of water, but it's ruggedly built, grippy backplate, and the back of it isn't made out of glass with a battery that genuinely lasts two days on a charge. When we spend most of the time detailing what the phone doesn't do well, you miss out on the commentary of what it was designed to do. When you review it for what it's not, you don't get a clear picture of what it actually is. And so it's easy to kind of disregard it or to say, oh, it's not good enough, not good enough. It needs to be cheaper and it needs to do more and it needs to be exactly like my Samsung. If it's exactly like my Samsung, I would buy it, but I won't buy it because if it were exactly like my Samsung, I would accuse them of copying Samsung and I would still buy a Samsung because I'm a savvy consumer. And I feel like we haven't owned that in the tech community that we are playing a part in that commentary and disregarding alternative solutions to getting these things done. And then we're shocked when there's less competition. No, we need more competition, but don't buy anything that's different than Samsung or Apple, but we need more competition, but don't. But we need, but don't. And I think we're, we need to get over that. We're paying lip service to the idea of competition while trashing everything that's a little bit different out in the marketplace. I, there, I don't want to make this a, a like a complete revisit of what the key to was or what it wasn't. I've got a couple of videos on my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash wombagnell. You can also find them on somegadgetguy.com. If you want to hear my thoughts on in, in greater detail on what this thing, I thought this thing really was. But it makes me sad, especially in light of these articles where, you know, like Apple security, not as good as we think it is. Law enforcement finding it much easier to break into those devices. And then you'd see tech reviewers act like BlackBerry security was no big deal. And you're like, there's a disconnect happening there. When I see a doctor walking into an appointment and they're wearing an Apple Watch and they pull out an old iPhone, and I know that they're using that to interact with me through private communication about my health data, that makes me very uncomfortable. But one of the nurses at my daughter's pediatrician raves about her BlackBerry. And I know there are far fewer people trying to crack open BlackBerry security than iPhone security. To me, that's a benefit. My daughter's medical records on her pediatrician's BlackBerry, safer. <laughs> safer than they'd be on an iPhone. Again, the likelihood of an exploit, not super high. Does that mean that we shouldn't be looking at alternatives for things like corporate grade, medical grade, government grade security? I think to this date, none of the BlackBerry Android phones have been rooted or rolled back to a previous build of Android, to a less secure build of Android. BlackBerry did not want to make, and they never claimed that they were going to make an Android multimedia device. They made BlackBerry smartphones that could use Android apps, and they did that in the best way possible. It didn't work when you did an emulation on the BlackBerry Passport, where you could emulate an Android environment and kind of run Android apps. They took the Android operating system and chewed it up a whole bunch, and then they locked it down tighter than any other manufacturer has. I think that's that's key. Like when we look at this part of their of their tweet, um, hold on, let me see. Uh, what made these devices great wasn't just the hardware developed and manufactured by TCL, but also the critical security and software features provided by BlackBerry Limited to ensure these were genuine BlackBerry devices. That's what they made. That's what they promised us. This was a BlackBerry first and foremost and you could still load up all of your leaky Google and smartphone apps if you wanted to, to open that up. So now, now they're gone. 
I don't think they were ever destined to be a top player in this market. I would never make the argument that if you liked your more multimedia focused device or your better for gaming device or your fancier, flashier camera device that you should have picked up a BlackBerry. But that completely ignores that minority of people who did really well on BlackBerry devices and that tiny minority of people where a BlackBerry probably would have been a better fit for them. Right? They're using a Samsung and everyone can kind of speak Samsung or they're using an iPhone and they, they can get everything they need to get done on an iPhone, but they would have loved the BlackBerry if they'd ever been able to give it a fair shot. And that's what makes me sad about our current state of competition and the, the current level of discourse in the gadget community. I know, I know I'm labeled as an LG shill or a Sony shill or a Pixel shill or a BlackBerry shill, which is funny because I mean, like those are the four brands I, I was sort of most interested in covering over the last two years. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a shill for all of them and I'm a hater of, of Apple and Samsung. But I'm really trying to hold to this idea. And I'm really trying to stay on an older gadget reviewing style of coverage. The unspoken agreement that we had in years past was we would use the coverage of our most popular content to subsidize the cost of fair and even-handed reporting on less popular devices, on less popular content. And now I feel like that doesn't really exist anymore. Where even when you cover an LG, a Sony, a Motorola, a Blackberry, the main focus of that coverage is to explain to Samsung users or Apple users why they were correct in buying a Samsung and not buying an LG, not buying a Motorola, not buying a BlackBerry. I think we've lost the idea of finding out who this product is for. Instead of saying, well, a general user won't like this, so no one should buy it, we should say, who is the exact right fit for this? And it's probably a very small community of consumers. But is there a way to make sure they know this exists because they will love this and the rest of us will go on using the more popular, flashier, prettier gadgets? That's when I feel we're at our best as tech enthusiasts, tech reviewers, and tech fans. We're absolutely at our worst when we act like there are winners and losers. It would be, it would be totally worth it if it were a different product and it were cheaper is useless commentary. And it disrupts competition, which means all of our gadgets get more boring. I want our gadgets to be fun and disruptive and exciting and to evolve more rapidly over time. And that can't happen if Samsung and Apple agree on what a smartphone should be, which they do. Every time Samsung makes fun of Apple, they copy Apple in the next generation. Oh, you have to get rid of your removable battery. You can't have a removable battery on an iPhone. <laughs> oh, by the way, on the Galaxy S6, we're getting rid of the removable battery. Oh, Apple, they, they got rid of the headphone jack. How hilarious. By the way, on the Note 10 and the Galaxy S20, you don't get headphone jacks anymore. That's not the way this should go down. I think we should have companies fighting for our dollars more than just winning us over with the biggest advertising budgets. And losing BlackBerry, TCL making great hardware, BlackBerry offering a unique security idea in the world of Android apps, I think that hurts. I think that's a bummer. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not thrilled about that. So, um, Yeah, I, I don't. I don't really have a, a pithy, fun, silly, uh, silly way to kind of wrap this up. But um, I don't know. I, I I'm I'm personally facing just some of the the exhaustion 
of phone after phone after phone after phone, review after review after review after review. So I really feel like 2020, I'm going to be doubling down on more use topics, more hands-on, less like here's the review template that I've, I, I've got the same, I use the same Word document to organize a smartphone review that I started with on this channel. It's not changed in seven years. <laughs> the only thing that changed for me was going from written reviews to video reviews, and then from video reviews of just the phone to video reviews of me on camera. The template hasn't changed. It's been the same. But when I pick up a Nook or a Raspberry Pi or a funky laptop or a laptop hybrid touchscreen tablet device, there are different things to talk about and there are more exciting things to talk about. So I really feel, again, just to keep me from getting mean and sardonic and, and angsty, like that's the necessary shift. Like I've got to start broadening some of that. But I, I, I don't know that this gets any better. I, I think especially in the world of mobile, for as much as I love the democratization of extreme computing power in everyone's pocket, I think like that pie's been baked. Unfortunately, like three major manufacturers are going to dictate what sells and what doesn't because of their ad budgets. And then the rest of the market's going to be not good enough because it's not popular, not because those options really do bring something unique to the table. And I want to say it's just an Apple thing, but Apple trained to the rest of the market that that's insanely profitable. So now it's the rest of the market too. You know, again, I can't look to Samsung as some kind of savior in this place because they're just piggybacking on all the same moves that Apple's made. So, so yeah, that's the gig. If um, if you start shop, you know what's what's hilarious is for these phones having been slightly, I, they were uh, on the more expensive tier of what I think a lot of smartphone consumers might have been shopping for. But there's no other alternative for a, a hardware keyboard on a phone in this market right now. If you can play with one, I'd say definitely go and check one out. They're still going to be supported for a couple more years as per local um, uh, law as it pertains to uh, customer support. And I'll definitely be holding on, not letting go of my red edition BlackBerry Key 2. Fun experiment. If you can if you can find one, if you can pick one up for cheap, if you can just kind of poke around on one. Because again, it's a wholly unique experience that no one else in the market can can properly offer. So uh, on that massive, massive bummer, <laughs> that that huge um, um, one is cranky and sad note, uh, we should probably wrap up this podcast. And also, I have to go to the bathroom like crazy. Um, from Damalix, D-A-M-A-L-Y-X, it's sad to see manufacturers gone, especially those who used to make their own operating system. And, and we're uh, from Sam, 20 miles. I'm keeping mine, my BlackBerry. Every OEM leaves me. <laughs> yeah, I'm definitely feeling the same way. Like I'm very anxious about about like uh, other other sort of known names in this market. Like what might happen with Nokia, BlackBerry, if we'll ever see an HTC label again. I'm hoping Motorola can can stage some kind of comeback. There's just so much room for market disruption right now. And it just takes it takes that effort in really investing in your consumer base so that you've got an organic grassroots fan base to then convince tech reviewers that they do actually need to take those products seriously. The tech reviewers aren't the gatekeepers. Someone like me, anyone who's making videos on YouTube, they're not the arbiters of taste. They make videos for consumers to watch. So if a lot of consumers are asking about OnePlus, well, now OnePlus is worth talking about because I make more money off of YouTube when OnePlus consumers watch my OnePlus videos. It's not the other way around. A reviewer doesn't dictate what is good or what isn't. Consumers dictate what reviewers make videos about. And that's the gig.
as much as I can air all of our dirty laundry, the number of content creators I talk to who off the record, they I, I would never quote them and they would never allow me to quote them, but who say, I have to make almost all of my videos about Samsung or Apple because then my channel would take a hit and my metrics would take a hit and YouTube would essentially punish my search and my visibility if I'm not constantly making videos about the most popular tech products is shocking and astounding. How many individual conversations I've had with content creators who probably wouldn't be making this quantity of videos or writing this quantity of articles on popular gadgets and would be broader if they could be. But that's the gig. Okay. So, um, <laughs> Gadget 2020, it's the evil algorithm. I, I, this uh, uh, algorithms uh, managing our content, it's gross. Folks, we're gonna wrap this up. I'm just over two hours. Thankfully, I didn't have a ton of uh, housekeeping, so we're getting close to ending this on time. Um, this is the continued plug to be an active participant, to be engaged in this conversation. If we care about these topics, if we care about our fandom for these products, um, we need to be leading these discussions and leading these conversations. And uh, I, I can't think of a better group, especially here in this live chat and the folks that have reached out to me and, and we've shared correspondence over social media or through email. Um, Again, why I, I so look forward to our Monday morning broadcasts is because it kind of refuels. It kind of gives me a little hope that we can still continue to have these broader gadget conversations. But beyond just whether or not you catch one of my live streams or you follow a few of these YouTubers, to also get out there and make sure that you're, you're voting with your wallet and you're voting with your time. Uh, if it's an initiative like my subreddit, Glowing Rectangles, um, that's awesome, and I absolutely appreciate and adore all of the participation that we've seen there. But even if it's just on your own social media, I found this cool video from a YouTuber with 500 subscribers, I think you should give him a watch, it means the world to someone building a channel. If it's, hey, I really like these guys over at Android Authority, you should check their podcast out, means that we don't lose their podcast. I can't think of a better example of topics today for you to be engaged about. Do you care about your privacy and security? Write your local elected officials that Lindsey Graham's bill is a bad idea for the future of the internet. Do you care about the content producers that you follow on YouTube? You gotta give them more than just a view or else they'll go away like the Android Authority podcast. Do you really wanna represent competition in the marketplace for different types of mobile gadgets and laptops and smartphones you got to actually honor competition when you find it or we lose a player like BlackBerry. Like Blackberry. This week is kind of a telling week that like we, we've, we've got to do better about this stuff or else our, 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 uh, our hobby here is going to get really boring and kind of dark and kind of ugly. So folks... Uh, I, I hope you'll continue joining me on these maudlin discussions. And uh, when we have happier things to talk about, trust me, I will absolutely be looking for happier things to talk about, especially as we've got MWC coming up. We're going to be getting a ton of new smartphone announcements. We're going to be seeing a, a, a march towards 5G. So hopefully we'll see some innovation in communications and infrastructure, some skepticism as to what 5G will actually bring, but we can hope. We can hope it'll be cool. We can hope it'll be fun. And then also just let's chat. Let's have some more of these conversations throughout the week where you can absolutely find me around the internet. I'm on the YouTube as Juan Bagnell, but you can find me as some gadget guy, somegadgetguy.com, some gadget guy on Twitter and Twitch and Instagram and Facebook. And let's find the fun in these types of things so that we can make sure uh, we've, we're, we're also those resources for our family and friends. If someone comes to us and says, hey, you know, what do I do for my next purchase? We want to know that we can properly address their needs and not just say, I don't know, iPhone, I guess. No one wants to talk to that tech nerd, <laughs> right? I don't want to talk to that tech nerd. So folks, thank you so much for watching, for sharing, for subscribing, and above all else, for, for, for participating, not just on my content, but on the content of everyone that's out there trying to have a well-rounded discussion about these types of products. 
Um, I'm going to catch you next week on another episode of the Monday Morning Tech Chat Show. I want you to have a fantastic week with your technology. I want you to do awesome with your technology. I want you to be awesome with your technology. And I'll catch you back here next Monday morning. Be well. Take care. I love you all. I'll catch you back.